Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum. Welcome to another edition of Friday Night Live with myself, Sulaiman Rabat. Alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah. Now it is the fifth edition of uh, Friday Night Live. And all praise and all glory and all thanks and all gratitude is only to Allah. As we recite in every rakat of every salah, Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise belongs to Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. Because no matter what you do, what you achieve, how you excel, it is only because Allah granted you the ability. It is only because Allah granted you the strength. It is only because Allah granted you the permission. It is only because Allah willed it and Allah decreed it. Uh, whatever we are and whatever um, potential we have and whatever intelligence or expertise or experience we have, all of it belongs to Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. All of it is because of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. And we hope that by showing gratitude to Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, not only will, be, will we be fulfilling our responsibility, which is to show gratitude to Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, but we will also be recipients of the promise mentioned in the Quran. La in shakartum la azidannakum. Where Allah wa ta'ala says, if you show gratitude, I will increase for you. If you show gratitude, I will increase for you. Wala in kafartum inna adabi la shadid. But if you do not show gratitude, then Allah wa ta'ala could punish you in, dip, in different ways. And one of the ways of uh, punishing is to deprive you, is to remove that blessing. May Allah wa ta'ala save us and may Allah wa ta'ala protect us uh, in that regard. So Allah is our creator, Allah is our sustainer, Allah is our nourisher, Allah is our cherisher, Allah is our everything. Allahu khaliqu kulli shay. Allah is the creator of everything. Everything besides Allah is useless. Everything besides Allah is futile. Everything besides Allah is irrelevant. So daily we should renew our focus on our relationship with Allah. Because the greatest relationship in the life of a Muslim ought to be his or her relationship with Allah. If your relationship with Allah is solid, if your relationship with Allah is sound, if your relationship with Allah is healthy, then your relationship with fellow human beings will also be sound, it will also be solid, it will also be healthy. The ulama tell us, if you experience turbulence in your relationship with your spouse, with your children, with your siblings, with your parents, with your employees, with your employer, with anybody, then check your relationship with Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. If you're on a good footing with your creator, then he will bless you in your relationship with others. And that's the most dependable relationship that ought to be the greatest relationship. At every juncture in my life, at every point in my life, at every turn in my life, at every difficulty in my life, my focus is on my Allah. Because my Allah is the greatest. There's nothing that is beyond my Allah. There's nothing that is greater than my Allah. There's nothing which can overwhelm my Allah. There's nothing that can render my Allah helpless. There's nothing which my Allah cannot do. There's nothing which my Allah does not know. There's nothing which my Allah cannot solve. So turn to Allah. As Muslims, we believe in Allah, but the great tragedy is we do not turn to Allah. And let's hope that this program, inshallah, with this very humble and feeble effort, Allah wa ta'ala makes it a means of conscientizing the speaker as well as the viewers to turn to Allah, to strengthen the relationship with Allah, to work with, on the relationship with Allah, to always uh, to be on the lookout that how can I enhance and how can I improve and how can I strengthen the relationship between my, uh, me and my Allah? What are the deficiencies in that relationship? How can I iron out those deficiencies? How can I remove those, those obstacles? How can I make Allah the first and the foremost in my life? How can I become conscious of Allah? That's the essence of taqwa. We hear about taqwa all the time. Ramadan is just around the, uh, the, the corner. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum al-siyam, kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum, la'allakum tattaqoon, la'allakum tattaqoon, la'allakum tattaqoon. So that your taqwa may increase, so that your taqwa may be enhanced, so that your taqwa may be improved. Taqwa is the consciousness of Allah, to be aware of Allah to have that relationship with Allah. May Allah wa ta'ala make us from the muttaqeen, truly from the Allah conscious. Because if we study Quran, and if we analyze the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and if we look into the lives of the pious, 
then we can see what a great quality taqwa is, what an effective tool it is in being successful, not only in this, year, in this world, but in the year after, and how essential an ingredient taqwa is in the recipe for success. May Allah wa ta'ala bless us in that regard. Now coming up uh, this evening on the program, inshallah, when we come back uh, from the break, the first thing we will be doing, will be, uh, we will commence with our tafsir segment, and then uh, after that, inshallah, we'll take a look at our current affairs issue for the week. That will be followed by our discussion on an anecdote or a story for the week. And then our nikah tab for the week. And finally, our discussion on a sunnah for the week, which we leave for last in the hope that that sunnah will be implemented immediately. And it will be something that we will remain focused on for the remainder of the week. So inshallah, when we come back, we will commence and we will start off with our tafsir discussion. Welcome back to Friday Night Live. We move on to our tafsir segment now. And today I want to discuss two sentences from verse number three of Surah Al-Ma'idah. Last week we also discussed a sentence from Surah Al-Ma'idah. Actually a phrase where Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala says, wa bil azlam. Where Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala talks about the distribution of arrows. And that uh, to make decisions based on the distribution of arrows is impermissible. It is haram. Thalikum fisq. Allah wa ta'ala says it's an act of transgression. And we explained last week that how the polytheists in Makkah used to work. They used to take uh, a camel and they sell it to ten people. But the meat is only distributed to seven. Now which seven? They put uh, the names of ten people attached to ten arrows into, uh, into a container. But they only pull out seven. And the seven that they pull out, those get a share. The other three are totally deprived. So the seven get more than what uh, is due to them. Because they are taking a portion of the share of the remaining three. And the three are to totally deprived. So in whichever form you do this, it boils down to an act of gambling. Where one person gets more than what is due to him. And another person gets less than what is due to him. Or is totally deprived. And Allah wa ta'ala says that is haram. Then we also gave a second interpretation with regards to the distribution of arrows. Uh, we said that Allama Alusi Baghdadi rahimahullah. In his magnum opus, Ruhul Ma'ani. The great tafsir of the Quran Kareem. He mentioned that what used to happen that uh, if a woman was immoral and uh, she was not f uh, sure who the father of the child was, they would put all the potential candidates' names on different arrows, and the arrow that they pull, that person will be considered the child's father. Or they would write on one arrow, my Rabb instructs me. They write on another arrow, my Rabb forbids me. They write on the third, uh, they leave the third arrow blank. Now they want to do something, they're not sure whether they must do it or not. We make mashwara and istikhara, they would go and pull out the arrows. If they pull out the one that says, my Rabb instructs me, they go ahead. If they pull out the one that says, my Rabb for, uh, for, uh, forbids me, they abstain. If they pull the blank one out, they repeat the process. And that led us to a discussion <coughs> with regards fortune tellers, with regards these people who advertise that they can predict the future, they can tell you whether your business venture will be profitable, they can tell you whether your spouse is loyal or not, they can tell you whether you, you have health problems or not. And uh, they, they, they claim to be able to see the unseen. And we discussed a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in that regard, um, classifying that as a very serious sin. And we spoke about weakness of iman, driving people to visit such, uh, such uh, uh, charlatans, people who are just there to make a quick buck, people who are just there to dupe people, to uh, sow discord, to create a difference between mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, between father-in-law and, uh, father and son-in-law, etc. So that is what we discussed last week. Now the very same verse, surah, uh, verse 3 of Surah Ma'idam, in the next sentence Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala mentions, الْيَوْمَ يَئِسَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِن دِينِكُمْ فَلَا تَخْشَوْهُمْ وَخْشَوْنَ That today the unbelievers have become despondent as far as harming your religion is, is concerned. So do not fear them, fear me. Now let me give you the backdrop first. Let me explain to you where this verse was revealed. It was revealed on the day of Arafah. The best day on which the sun rises is the day of Arafah. Then it was revealed at the time of Jumu'ah, this particular sentence. Sahaba and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were in a state of ihram. It was on the plains of Arafah near Jabal Rahmah, the mountain of mercy. It was on the occasion of Hajjatul Wida. So here Allah wa ta'ala is saying to Sahaba and to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that for 13 years in Makkah, you were persecuted. For 13 years in Makkah, you were on the back foot. For 13 years in Makkah, you could do very little to defend yourself. You could do very little to state your case. Abu Jahl would harass Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
Abu Lahab left no stone unturned in harming Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The the leaders of the Quraysh were constantly ridiculing, constantly mocking, constantly scolding Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the Nabi of Allah was fighting an uphill battle. The Nabi of Allah had his back against the wall, so to speak. The Nabi of Allah was on the back foot. When Hijrah took place, things improved a little, but there were still huge challenges. There was Badr, there was Uhud, there was Khandak, there was Ahzab, there was Hudaybiyah. When Sahaba were prevented from, from even making Umrah, they had to remove their haram and they had to come back the next year to perform Umrah. The Treaty of Hudaybiyah was very lopsided, very one-sided. So if you look at the 13 years of Makkah, the 13 years of the Meccan era, then another 7 or 8 years after Hijrah, when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in Medina, approximately 20 years, approximately 20 dec- uh, two decades before the 8th year after Hijrah, which was the year when the conquest of Makkah took place. For 20 years, for two decades, the Nabi of Allah was on the back foot. The Nabi of Allah had his back against the wall. It was an uphill battle. It was putting out one fire after the other. At times the thought would have crossed the minds of Sahaba that instead of all the time reacting to the polytheists, defending against the munafiqeen and the hypocrites, worrying about the Roman army advancing on Medina, when will that time come when we can focus all our energies on something positive? When will that time come when we can focus all our strengths on advancing the deen and doing more for our relationship with Allah and, and, and doing more in terms of worship to Allah? All the time we occupied in putting out fires. But Allah wa ta'ala teaches us an important lesson here. Now it's the 10th year after Hijrah. From the time of the conquest of Makkah, the tide now changed. Things started to happen very differently. And this was the promise of Allah. And that's why after Hudaybiyah, when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa was leaving Hudaybiyah, going back to Medina, Sahaba were very despondent. Even the likes of Umar radiallahu had taken a very hard knock. That there's such a lopsided agreement. When are we now going to overcome these challenges? When can we, when can we get out of the reverse mode, so to speak? We're always ducking and diving, uh, trying to avert this danger, trying to avert that danger. When are we going to move forward now uh, in terms of doing purely positive work? And Allah wa ta'ala told them, Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. I've opened for you a manifest victory. They could not understand it at that time. They were so despondent that this lopsided agreement in Hudaybiyah, what manifest victory? But this is what you call faith. This is what you call iman, putting your reliance in Allah. And then Allah promised on the occasion of the conquest of Makkah, Hudaybiyah led to the conquest of Makkah because that very treaty which was so heavily in favor of the Quraysh, they breached the treaty and that opened up the opportunity for the conquest of Makkah. On the occasion of the conquest of Makkah, what did Allah wa ta'ala say? And we should take inspiration from the surah because we recite it all the time in Salah. إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ Allah says, when the assistance of Allah will come and, will, and when, when conquest will come, when victory will come. وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَ And when you will see people entering Islam in droves, فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ Now, you glorify Allah to a greater extent and you seek forgiveness from Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. So this verse revealed on the plains of Arafah, on the day of Jumu'ah, at the, on the occasion of Hajjatul Wida. Now, what do we learn from here? Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala is saying to Sahaba, saying to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on the occasion of Hajjatul Wida, which is two years after the conquest of Makkah, when things have changed now, 124,000 Sahaba came for, for the Hajjatul Wida. And there was a time when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam only had Abu Bakr to defend him. He only had Abu Talib who didn't even believe in his message to defend him. And now look at the position of strength. So Allah wa ta'ala says to Sahaba, now your enemy has become weak. Now your enemy has become despondent. They no longer have the political might. They no longer have the military clout. They no longer have the finance. They no longer have the leadership. They no longer have the, the, the willpower. So now you can focus on the positive. فَلَا تَخْشَوْهُمْ don't worry too much about them. Wakhshon, wakhshoni. Now focus more on your ibadah to Allah wa ta'ala. So what's the underlying principle? What do we learn from all of this? There are fluctuations in life. There are peaks and valleys in life. You go through the difficult periods where it's all, all, all defense. You got to put out this fire. You got to put out that fire. You're on the back foot all the time. Your back is against the wall. Sometimes you become despondent. Sometimes you become frustrated. And look at the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the, the, so to speak, challenging times were two, was two decades, 20 years. And it was only in that last three or four years when things started to flow and thing, things started to run smoothly. But the system of Allah is such, 
with, with, with difficulty, ease has to follow. And with every time there's difficulty, ease has to follow. 20 years of difficulty. But when the ease came, people started to accept Islam in multitudes. Islam spread through the Arabian Peninsula in a manner that was amazing and, and was spectacular. And now Sahaba could focus on the positive. Now Sahaba could focus on, 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 on doing more ibadah, spending more time in recitation of the Quran. Now they could perform hajj properly for the first time. Up to this point, performing hajj was even difficult. So the lesson we must take from here, and the inspiration we must take from here, sometimes you have to go through those difficult periods. We might feel, I'm putting out so many fires, I might as well just give up, I might as well just leave it. But if you persevere, if you remain steadfast, the difficult period might be longer than the period of ease. It was two decades, it was 20 years that the Nabi of Allah had to withstand all those challenges up to the point of the, of the conquest of Makkah in the 80th of the Hijrah. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa passed away not long after Hajjatul Wida. So it was those last two years in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where we saw the period of ease coming in now, where we saw the tide changing and where we saw Sahaba now starting to see uh, many positive developments. So in our lives, uh, in our endeavors, you're going to go through those periods of difficulty. You're going to go through those periods where everything seems to be going wrong. Everyone seems to be turning against you. Every issue that could possibly rise up is rising up. But you've got to remain steadfast. You've got to keep your head uh, high. You've got to keep your feet firm. You've got to turn to Allah. That's what Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. You've got to remain focused on your relationship with Allah. As I mentioned when, just when we just commenced the program, focus on Allah and everything else will fall into place. Even though there's difficulty, even though there's hardship, but you'll be able to remain focused. You'll be able to remain steadfast. And then... When that difficulty finally comes to an end and you see the period of prosperity, subhanallah, even in a very mundane examples, many times we would hear our, 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 our forefathers tell us, our forebears tell us that, you know, for so many years I was just breaking even. For so many years I was struggling in the shop and, you know, just trying to do business this way, that way. We were just meeting the expenses. We were just managing to live and sustain ourselves. And then all of a sudden, Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala opened up the doors of barakah. And Allah opened up the doors of blessings. Now I have multiple shops. Now I have all my children and my grandchildren in the business. And alhamdulillah, it's sufficient for all of them. So that's the, the reward of perseverance. This dunya is not a perfect place. A dunya sijjunul mu'min. This dunya is a prison for a believer. Difficulty upon difficulty, travail upon travail, hardship upon hardship. The Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam were those who went through the most difficulty, those who went through the most hardship, those who had to bear and those who had to withstand the most. But then when Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala opens up, and then when Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala brings in that period of ease, it makes it all worthwhile. May Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. Welcome back to Friday Night Live. Uh, we move on now to our current affairs segment for the week. This week, um, it was somewhat surprising, somewhat uh, alarming to read in the newspapers and to hear in the media that the Azapu Youth League had called on former President Nelson Mandela and national icon Madiba to apologize to the nation. And they were very uh, strong in their criticism, very scathing and very stinging in their criticism, saying that they believed that uh, Nelson Mandela had sold out the nation that he was power hungry, he wanted to get onto the, the, the seat of power, and he agreed to terms that uh, crippled the nation, uh, economically, financially, socially, and to an extent politically. They felt that he agreed to terms with the former apartheid regime that did not hold the country in good stead going forward. And now 18 years uh, after democracy, 19 years, 18 years after the, election, the first elections, democratic elections in, uh, in 1994, they felt many of the economical and social uh, consequences and challenges that uh, we face and that we see and that are being discussed and debated and, 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 uh, the, and are being dealt with are as a result of um, the, 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 the negotiations that were not thorough and that were not well thought out at that particular time. And they said that whilst Mandela is still alive, he should uh, apologize to the nation, it would uh, soothe his conscience uh, and that uh, it, would, it would ease matters to a great extent. Naturally, there was a lot of outrage. The ANC came out and said that they wouldn't even dignify such comments with, uh, with a response. Nelson Mandela never acted in his individual capacity. There was no unilateral uh, peace brokering between him and the apartheid regime. He was acting 
on behalf of the ANC as a collective. He was the leader of the ANC. Now, obviously, that attack by the Azampo Youth League was a very personal one. It, 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 it was laced uh, with a lot, of, um, uh, vig uh, well, a lot of malice, one could argue. And uh, it, it, it was definitely questioning the, the integrity of a personality which is, or who is held in very high regard here in South Africa. But I wanted to know, and I posed this question uh, to people, that uh, let's assume that Mandela was indeed very sincere, and that's what many people believe, and in all likelihood that was the reality. He wanted the best for South Africa. He wanted to genuinely see reconciliation because he did not want uh, a civil war to break out. Things were tense, especially after the assassination of, uh, of Chris Hani. But were there some mistakes that were made? Was there a degree of naivety at that time where political control was secured and uh, economical control was not secured? And now 18 years down the line, economical control in the country uh, still lies in the hands of the elite minority. And that's why it's created space for the likes of Julius Malema to utilize that as a political football. Uh, they want to further their own agendas. They want to further their own political careers. But they found that political football. And it's something which was close to the hearts of people. For many years, it was an undercurrent. It was under the surface. People had managed to brush it under the carpet. But now, social realities and economic realities are starting to hit. And they're starting to hit very hard. People are saying, I voted ANC. I was from the underprivileged, from the oppressed. And 18 years down the line, I'm still living in a shack. I still can't find a job. And those who benefited from apartheid, they continue to benefit. Um, they continue to, to have control on the economy. This, uh, we spoke about it last week as well, that uh, a survey has, has, uh, has shown that uh, the most uh, dividing factor in South Africa is no longer race. It is this inequality when it comes to wealth, this inequality when it comes to economic issues. We have a very skewed economy, one of the most uh, uh, skewed economies in the world. So was there a mistake, perhaps? Was, was there an unintended consequence that uh, in that, in that rush to, to secure uh, you know, reconciliation without civil war breaking up, without there being any acrimony, without there being any unnecessary killing or spilling of blood, which was very noble and very necessary at the time. Some argued, some politicians told me, ANC politicians gave me feedback and said, at the time it, would, it was expected that perhaps those who were previously privileged at the expense of others uh, would, would reciprocate. They would look at that good gesture from the side of Madiba, from the side of Mandela, and... Uh, and the, uh, and the ANC, and they would over a period of time try and then even out the playing fields when it came to the, to the economic side of things, when it came to the financial side of things. And obviously, the reality on the ground is that that has not happened. That has not happened. So this brought us all to the point. Uh, some people took offense and said, but why are we looking at things so retrospectively? Why are we going back uh, so many years? Uh, the man is old. What's the point? I don't think anyone is criticizing. Everyone, uh, everyone really appreciates that spirit of reconciliation, especially from a man who came out of prison after having served for 27 years. It's a remarkable achievement to put aside that feeling of hatred and that feeling of animosity and that, that desire to avenge and that desire, desire to settle the scores and to lay, look at the greater good of the country. And we have far more remarkable examples in our history. The example of Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, who was snatched from the lap of his father, who was taken from the house of Nubuwa by his own brothers. And what a life he had to lead. How many years he, he spent in prison. But when he came into a position of authority, it was, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم. There will, be no, there will be no blame on you today. I will ask Allah to forgive you. يغفر الله لكم. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's example in that regard, 13 years, how was the Nabi of Allah persecuted? Three years, that economic boycott in, in, the, in the valley of Abu Talib, where Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had to see his own children chew on leaves out of intense hunger and that had an effect on the physical health of Fatima radiallahu anha and as a result she passed away at an early age his wife who was a very affluent woman having to suffer because she was showing, showing solidarity with the husband Sumayya radiallahu anha who was killed in a very wretched manner uh, the daughter of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who was injured when she tried to leave Makkah lost her baby and eventually lost her life his two daughters who were divorced all the torture, all the punishment. Yet when the Nabi of Allah comes at the head of a strong army and the polytheists are now weak, he echoes the sentiments of Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam. La tathriba alaykum al There is no blame on you today. Yaghfiru Allahu lakum. May Allah forgive you. Wa huwa arhamur rahimin. Because Allah wa is the most merciful of those who show mercy. 
Coming back to that particular issue about Mandela and the reconciliation discussions, political, political power was, was secured for, the, for those who were oppressed, for the underprivileged, for the blacks of the country, and the ANC came into power. But economic power still remains with the, with the elite few. Even from amongst those who were underprivileged previously, amongst those who were oppressed previously, there are a few that have come out and have managed to secure economic uh, 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 power, who have managed to amass a degree of wealth. There are few, the likes of Tokyo Sihuale, Patrice Mutsepe, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, etc. But the majority continue to suffer from an economic perspective and from a social perspective. And for the second week now, I'm reiterating this point. But as a country, this is a huge challenge. Perhaps we need to look at it retrospectively because you need to learn from history. We don't point fingers at anyone. We don't question anyone's integrity. It was an unintended consequence. No one knew that uh, you know, the, the, the status quo would remain with regards to the economic side of it and that 18 years on, uh, many, many people, the majority of people would be still in that uh, same kind of economic difficulty, if not in a worse kind of economic difficulty. And we've seen the frustration of people start to manifest itself in the form of service delivery protests, etc. But as a, as a country, I don't have all the answers, but we need, to, we need to put our minds together. We need to deliberate on this. We cannot say, well, we are comfortable in our own little lagers and that in our community there is no issue. I'm doing my part for my country. I'm paying my taxes. We cannot live in a vacuum. We cannot live in isolation from the rest of the country. And when there is this undercurrent, it will not be justified if it overflows and there is then behavior that is not acceptable. But at the same time, it's not realistic for us and it's not, f it's not fair for us to continue to ignore these realities and then not be happy when the consequences hit us. May Allah grant us the understanding. Welcome back to Friday Night Live. We now move on to our story for the week. And this week I want to, I want to discuss a story in, uh, in reference and in regard to Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhuma. This was a great Sahabi. He was the son of a great personality, Umar bin Khattab radiallahu an. He spent a lot of time in the company of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Nabi of Allah spoke about him in very glowing terms. There's a narration in Bukhari where the Nabi of Allah said to his sister Hafsa radiallahu anham, was in the nikah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Abdullah is a very good man and he has excellent qualities. Only one thing he needs to add is that, and that is the performance of tahajjud salah. And then he obviously added that to his life. And uh, later on, uh, because he was very young in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he lived for many years after the demise of Nabi alayhi salatu wa sallam. And he became one of the seniors amongst the sahaba. And it is generally believed that uh, ultimately he passed away after being poisoned by the great uh, tyrant and dictator Hajjaj bin Yusuf Thaqafi because he was very vocal and he was very uh, forceful in his criticism of the dictatorial and the brutal regime of Hajjaj bin Yusuf uh, Thaqafi. Generally also the ulama speak about uh, the four Abdullahs, the four Abdullahs amongst the Sahaba that, uh, that are famous and that were renowned for their knowledge and their understanding of deen and the closeness to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the likes of Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhumam, who is known as Raisul Mufassirin, the father of Tafsir. Then you've got Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu an. He was known as among, um, amongst the Sahaba as being the most knowledgeable. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said that uh, the knowledge of the entire Sahaba can be found in six. And the knowledge of the six can be found in two. And those two, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu an and Ali radiallahu an, that was a common saying amongst Sahaba. Uh, those who follow the Hanafi school of thought, Many of the rulings of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah are based on the teachings of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anh, because the teachers of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah uh, were actually the, the students of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anh. So uh, he's the second, then you've got Abdullah bin Umar, and then some say it's Abdullah bin Amr bin As, the fourth, or some would put Abdullah bin Zubair in, in, in the category of the fourth, but they call them the Ubadalai Arba'am, the four Abdullahs that were prominent in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Abdullah bin Umar, the story is in reference to him and with regards to him. One day, many years after the demise of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhumam was traveling with an entourage with a large number of people and there were sahaba there, there were his students there, when suddenly he saw a grave. And as soon as he saw the grave, he stopped his conveyance, he stopped his animal, he immediately dismounted and he performed two rakats of salah. 
Now, Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu was renowned for being very meticulous in following the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa To this extent, that when he would, he would take a journey or undertake a journey from Medina to Makkah, he would stop at exactly the spot where the Nabi of Allah stopped to relieve himself. He would relieve himself at that very same spot. He was a very meticulous follower of the sunnah of Rabbi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So his students were very eager and they were waiting with a great degree of anticipation for him to complete his salah. They wanted to know, did the Nabi of Allah perform salah? Yeah, is there some significance? Is there some wisdom in you standing uh, alongside this grave and performing two rakats of salah? And when he had terminated his salah, they said to him, Yabna Umar, O oh, the son of Umar, is somebody buried here who you know? Is there a close relative here? He said, no. They said, is there any specific, particular benefit to performing two rakats of salah at this particular spot? He said, no. So they said then, why did you dismount? We were traveling on journey. There was no indication that we were going to stop. And suddenly, very abruptly, you stopped and you got off your conveyance and you performed two rakats of salam. And what a remarkable uh, answer Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu gave. He said, listen, as we were traveling and this grave came into view, I, I saw this grave. Allah put the thought in my mind that the occupant of this grave, the person sleeping in this grave, whoever he or she may be, as much as they may desire and as much as they may want to, they cannot perform two rakat salah. They no longer have that opportunity because their life has come to an end. This dunya is the place for action. The akhirat is the place for recompensation. They can no longer perform the two rakat salah and secure any reward. And immediately I thought to myself, Oh Abdullah, there's no guarantee of life. You don't know even if you live for the next five minutes. So that's why I stopped and I performed two rakats of salah. Whilst I'm still breathing, whilst I'm still alive, whilst I still have the opportunity. And that's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ni'matan, there are two bounties of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala, Maghboonun fihima kathirun min nas The majority of people are in deception with regards to those two bounties. As-sihah, your good health. Al-faragh, the time and opportunity which Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala has given you. And the lesson here is, we should value our time. The more you value your time, the more Allah wa ta'ala would pull barakah in your time. And when you don't value your time, Allah will make it that it will take you longer than that person who values his time to accomplish the same task. So a great and a profound lesson that we learn from the life of Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhuma. May Allah grant us the understanding. Welcome back to Friday Night Live. We move on to our marriage segment. This is where we give a tip for the week that will inshallah enable us and assist us to uh, enhance our marriages and to improve our marriages. Whether we be newlyweds or whether we be married for many years and also for those who are yet to get married inshallah, they can take advice and they can take benefit from this and it will hold them in good stead inshallah when they do get married. Uh, we spoke last week about the importance of education. We said that uh, people focus on the wedding day but they don't focus on the marriage. Nobody reads about what is nikah from an Islamic perspective. What is expected from you as a husband? What is expected from you uh, as a wife? What are the uh, rights and responsibilities of husband and wife? How do you deal with issues in marriage? How do you overcome uh, uh, challenges? How do you regulate turbulences? Uh, we don't educate our children. We don't learn. Not the theory and definitely not the practical aspects. Those qualities that are required for a... For a uh, Successful marriage, the key ingredients in the recipe for marital bliss, those are missing. We don't teach our children anger management. We don't teach them to control their tongue. We don't teach them discipline. We don't teach them to be uh, time conscious. And now they go into marriage and we think that automatically just because they got married, they're going to shed all of those bad habits. It doesn't happen. It's not realistic. They carry those bad habits into their marital lives and then it has an impact on the marriage. And many times the marriage takes, the marriage takes strain. And in many instances, it buckles under that uh, strain. Now, moving forward today, the point I want to discuss is one of uh, never trying to resolve a dispute in marriage when you are angry or when your spouse is angry. Sometimes you may feel, well, my spouse being angry is unjustified and I want to clear this issue and I want to get it out of my system now and now. Never do that. As much as you may be eager to do so, as much as uh, your emotions are telling you that let's get it done with now we don't want to go to bed angry with one another when either one of you are, are angry you're not going to come to a, a good solution you're not going to come to a, a good resolution you're going to just vent your anger and when you vent your anger 
you're not looking at it uh, from a perspective of resolving the issue. You're looking at how can you get back at the opposite party. You feel insulted, you feel hurt, you feel let down. Now you want to get back at that person. You want to get back at your spouse. And that was, that's what anger does. And if the spouse is angry and you now try and engage and you try and have a discussion, they venting their frustration and anger, it's possible it can make you angry. So when both of you are angry, then it's absolute no-no. Don't have a discussion, even on the issue that has made you angry or has made one of the parties angry or both of the parties angry, let the anger subside. Because al-ghadab wa jununun, anger is a form of madness. You don't have control then of your emotions. Your emotions cloud your intellect. It is in those moments that women request for talaq. It is in those moments that men who love their wives and who generally have good relationships with their spouses in, in, in frustration and in anger utter the talaq and then later on there's a lot of regret and complications and then they suffer and the children suffer. Never try and resolve an issue when you are angry. Give one another the space. Even though the petrol price is high, go for a long drive. Let the anger subside. Cool down. Make wudu. Recite ta'awud. If you're standing, sitting, sit. If you're sitting, lie down. All the advices that the ulama give us as far as uh, controlling your anger is concerned. When the anger is subsided and when now you feel I got uh, good control over my emotions, now sit down and have a calm and a mature discussion about the issue at hand and what you feel and give the opposite party an opportunity to express their sentiments on the issue and then try and come to a, a, a conclusion that even if we agree to disagree, even if we don't see the matter from exactly the same perspective or we don't conclude on the matter in the same way, let us now combine forces to see how we can map the way forward together. That's the important thing. Agreeing is not necessarily the important thing. Having uh, the same conclusion is not necessarily the important thing. You can agree to disagree. You are two individuals. You're not going to agree on everything. You can come to two different conclusions. But going forward, you must be united in mapping out the way in terms of how to overcome that particular situation, irrespective of whose fault it is, irrespective of how you feel or how your spouse feels. May Allah grant us the understanding. Welcome back to Friday Night Live. We now move on to our final segment, and that is our Sunnah for the week. And as I mentioned every week, here we want you to take something practical from uh, the program, something that uh, you can implement, inshallah, and something that uh, will bring us closer to the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, we have been discussing the Sunnahs of uh, eating. Last week, we spoke about uh, cleaning the utensil, cleaning the plate. Some people feel that it's an act of greed, that you're licking up every morsel, and, uh, and every grain. No, it's not an act of greed. It is a sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because we don't know which grain or which morsel or, or which speck of that uh, particular uh, meal uh, has, the, has the greater barakah and the greater blessings and will give us greater nourishment, not only physically but uh, spiritually as well. Then we discussed last week uh, a narration when it is mentioned that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said if a person eats from a plate and cleans it, the plate will make dua to Allah for the forgiveness of that person. And we explained last week that we may consider a plate to be inanimate, something which is non-living. We have our own definitions. If a thing can move, can uh, make sound, uh, can breathe, then we classify it as animate and living. But in the definition of Allah, uh, everything has, uh, has some degree of life in it. Because the Quran says, وَإِن مِّن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِهِ وَلَكِن لَّا تَفْقَهُونَ تَسْبِيحَهُمْ Everything makes the dhikr of Allah and glorifies Allah wa ta'ala. Then we also discussed the hadith last week that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that if you clean the plate thoroughly and if you cleanse the plate thoroughly that the plate makes dua for you. That oh Allah, save him from the fire of Jahannam as he saved me from shaitan. Oh Allah, save him from the fire of Jahannam as he saved me from shaitan. Now moving on today, we talk about licking the fingers. It is also a sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to lick the fingers. The ulama teaches and explain to us, the Nabi of Allah ate with three fingers. The Nabi of Allah ate with the thumb, the Nabi of Allah ate with the index, and the Nabi of Allah ate with the middle finger. The Nabi of Allah would eat with these three fingers. And this is a sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And after eating, the Nabi of Allah would lick the fingers. This is showing appreciation to Allah for his bounties. Whatever of the food remains on the on the fingers you don't wash that away and let it go down the drain you lick your fingers and thereafter you you, you wash your hands for purposes of hygiene and to cl to cleanse your hands 
and uh, it is it is uh, it is a token of appreciation as i said and whatever barakah and blessing remains on that food which is on your hands you're not depriving yourself of that uh, of that barakah and blessing now how would the nabi of allah lick his fingers the ulama say the nabi of allah would first lick the middle finger then he would lick the index finger and then he would lick the thumb because generally the in, the middle finger is the longest finger so it gets the most messier it reaches deepest into the food so you lick the middle finger first and then the index finger and then uh, the thumb and it is also sunnah it is one sunnah to lick the fingers after you have eaten so there's three things here the nabi of allah would eat with three fingers that's one sunnah he would lick the three fingers after eating that's a second sunnah and he would lick the fingers three times that's a third sunnah meaning that not only once but he would lick the fingers thrice so to eat with three fingers is a sunnah to lick the fingers after you have eaten is a sunnah and to lick the fingers thrice is a sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then the ulama say it is also permissible to eat with five fingers some of us might utilize all five of our fingers to eat that is permissible but the preferred way is three fingers there might be some dishes there might be some food wherein it is difficult to eat with three fingers and hence you would need five fingers there is permissibility for that in the sharia ah, but we should try and practice and we should try and bring ourselves onto the level where we can eat with three fingers because that is a sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so remember after we have eaten and teach our children this as well clean the plate when nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam and sahaba used to finish eating uh, the women folk of the house could see exactly which was the plate of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam simply because uh, that was the cleanest plate then eat with three fingers lick the fingers after you have eaten lick the fingers thrice and if need be if it's very really difficult or it's a kind of dish where three fingers would not suffice then the sunnah gives us the laxity and it gives us uh, the room to utilize five fingers to eat look at the beauty of our deen subhanallah look at what a great deen allah tabarak wa ta'ala has given us in that even to this extent rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has given us guidelines even to this extent the nabi of allah has given us teachings and directives may allah tabarak wa ta'ala grant us uh, the understanding we conclude the program once again by making a dua and a supplication to allah rabbana taqabbal minna innaka antas sami'ul alim oh allah accept whatever we have said that is not worthy of acceptance it's a broken effort but allah you accept you make it a means of hidayah and guidance for the speaker for all the viewers and for all those across the globe ameen ya rabbal alamin until next week again from myself suleiman rabbit fi amanillah assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh man da yufarrij qalban fata yudhina wa yazra'u alwarda fina wa rayahina wa yanshur alhadiya imanan wa mawahatan fabil jahalati qad qabat masa'ina من دا يفرج قلبا بات من دا يفرج قلبا بات يضنينا ويزرع الورد فينا والرياحينا